Today, we are joined by Lila June. She's an indigenous public speaker, artist, and community organizer. You know, greetings, my kin and my people. The, the ability to play God is almost a sport in the capitalist culture to see how much power and control we can wield. Which planets can we get to? The Mayan civilizations, every one of those we tried to play God and every one of those collapsed. And that is our gift. That collapse is creator's gift to us saying, hey, let's help you live a little more righteously. Let's help you live a little more in touch with reality that you are a part of creation. You are not the God of creation. They said, these are not just trees. These are our relatives. And I was like, wow, they see the world the way we as native people see the world. What's the best way for someone like me to become involved in a land back movement? One is to give your land back. <laughs> Hello and welcome to episode 20 of the Palestine Pod, the weekly podcast where we break down the latest headlines dealing with Palestine from all over the world and bring you stories, commentary, and interviews with the aim of spreading awareness about the Palestinian struggle for justice and equal rights. I'm one of your hosts, Lara E. You might know me from Instagram as at Gazan Girl, and I'm joined by my co-host, Mikey B. What's up, y'all? Mikey B on TikTok, Michael Scherzer on Instagram, and Mikey Intifada, if you've been calling for democracy in Cuba and apartheid in Palestine. Yeah, that's awkward. <laughs> Before we get into today's episode, please like, comment, and subscribe if you hang out with us on YouTube. If you're listening on a podcast app, subscribe and leave a review if you can. And as always, you can find our full episodes and sources at palestinepod.com. And if you want to get involved in the conversation, feel free to reach out to us at palestinepod at gmail.com and follow us on Instagram at the Palestine Pod. Today, we are joined by Lila June. She's an indigenous public speaker, artist, scholar, and community organizer of the Diné and Sesesas nations from Taos, New Mexico. Lila, welcome to the Palestine Pod. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for being here. We are so excited for this conversation and hoping that it can be one small effort to contribute to an already solid foundation of Native and Palestinian solidarity. Yes, ma'am. So to get started, I was watching one of your interviews where you were speaking about the primitive nature of this modern world. You said primitive because it is rooted in breaking what the creator has made. You gave examples of how intervention in the environment through dams, for example, is an instance of breaking what the creator has made. And you spoke about the importance of allowing water to flow in nature. I think the biggest offenders of this principle to break what the creator has made has to be colonialism and its economic counterpart, capitalism. I'm wondering if you can elaborate more on how colonialism specifically drives the breaking of what the creator has made and give more examples from Turtle Island. Sure, I'd be happy to share my limited perspective on that. I feel like the elders know so much more about this, but I have been trying to listen to them for a while. And before I do speak, I just have to, you know, do my traditional duty of mentioning my clans as a Diné woman on my mom's side. So, yeah, it's a Diné. You know, greetings, my kin and my people. I'm from the Nanisht Ejitachitni clan of the Diné nation. We're also incorrectly known as Navajo. Uh, my father's mothers of the Southern Cheyenne nation. My mother's father is Salt clan of the Diné nation. My father's father is of the European clans. In that manner, I present myself as a Dene woman. So how does colonialism drive a culture that breaks what creator has made continually? One of my elders said something interesting recently. She said, you know, you have to have compassion for the Euro-Americans because they came to this continent with basically hoarding and gaining a surplus as their primary goal. That is their goal. And she said the reason that that was their goal is because in Europe at the time, they had just finished over 2,000 years of open warfare. I mean, just pure open warfare. And she said hoarding and, and gaining a surplus was their survival mechanism, the only one they were afforded. When you have that much intergenerational trauma, 2,000 years of open warfare, 
that becomes one of the symptoms of your trauma is you think that that's normal to, to look at a piece of land and say, Hmm, how, how could I get a surplus out of this? Or to look at another people and say, Hmm, am I better or worse than them? Or to look at a, at a, at a group of people and say, Hmm, how can I turn these people into my, my slaves? You know, that is not natural way of thinking. That's, that's after millennia of torture you know, women getting burned alive, women getting thrown into the ocean, you know, torture chambers, inquisition, Roman expansion, blah, 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 blah. I mean, it's just, it's just unimaginable. And so how does that in turn drive colonialism? I mean, that is colonialism. That is the extractionist mindset comes from that many centuries of, of trauma. And so then how does that drive breaking what the creator has made? Well, I think a big part of breaking what creator has made is this idea of playing God, the deification of Elon Musk, not only the world deifying him, but himself deifying himself. <laughs> if you look at his Twitter thingy, I think it says techno king or something like that's how he self identifies as a techno king. And the, the ability to play God is almost a sport in the capitalist culture to see how much power and control we can wield. Which planets can we get to? How much can we mine out of the earth to turn ourselves into what we want to be? And lastly, you know, just the way that 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 we we want to show nature how much we can control her. We want to show nature how much we can wield her. And that's exactly like treating a woman that way in a household. Like she's not there for us to control her. She's there for us to love her and be loved by her. She is a sovereign being. She has feelings. She has dreams of her own. And our job is to be humble before her. And every single culture that has ever played God, be it the Chaco civilization that my ancestors descend from, the mound builders who, you know, some of the Mississippian cultures descend from, the Mayan civilizations, every one of those we tried to play God and every one of those collapsed. <laughs> <laughs> the Romans collapsed. Every time humans try to put themselves either on a pyramid or a towering house or a mound or, you know, a, a basilica or whatever, trying to play God, they always go down. And that is our gift. That collapse is creator's gift to us saying, hey, let's help you live a little more righteously. Let's help you live a little more in touch with reality that you are a part of creation. You are not the God of creation. What a beautiful answer. Thank you so much for sharing those insights. I'm reminded of the churches that were struck by lightning and burned down recently. The part of Turtle Island that some people call Canada, there were white settlers who were terribly upset that this church had burned down, but they had almost nothing to say when the native fisheries were targeted and burned to the ground. You said that every time a society finds itself, you know, on top and they try to play God, that they eventually fall. And, I, and when you were talking about, you know, on top of your pyramid or whatever, I started thinking of sniper towers, you know, in Palestine and how everything about settler colonialism in Palestine. And of course, in Turtle Island, what is known as, you know, North America um, is about taking as much as possible. And as you said, hoarding, hoarding land, hoarding resources, expelling others from their land and using brute force to maintain these structures of violence and injustice. And it's crazy that these things still continue until today. It's crazy that, you know, Palestinians continue to be ethnically cleansed the native people continue to be ethnically cleansed, that their land is not protected, and that we are watching it all happen, even though this is something that should have been left in the past, even though this is something that, that in our minds seems historical, but it's actually still happening until today. I think a lot of people incorrectly speak about settler colonialism in the US as if it was something that happened in the past, if it's you know, as a historical fact, and not as a present issue. They speak about native people as if they were all exterminated, when in reality, that's not, that's not true. And these issues are still contemporary. They're still relevant. 
And so that also means that there's a possibility to make change, right? We have, we have an opportunity to forge a different future. And we talk a lot on the Palestine pod about liberation, what liberation of Palestine would look like, how Palestinians would want to just live on their land unbothered by bulldozers and tear gas and impending forced expulsions. These are simple things that we just want to live without being expelled from our home. And I think people don't realize enough how liberation isn't this like crazy radical thing where we want to also take your place as the occupier, where we want to take your place as the one who's on top. We just want to live peacefully. That's really what it's all about. And I think, yeah, when I think about breaking what the creator has made, I also think about breaking the, the, the sort of the human spirit to just want to live unbothered, right? That's also to me what it's about and imposing a system where it's just total chaos. Yeah, I, I definitely have a response to that. So just like it's really important not to play God, I think it's also really important to know we are human and other people are human. I think that was kind of following what you were saying. One of the ways that colonialism or in my worldview, coyote, you know, this spirit that's always tricking us into di being divided against each other, this spirit that's always bringing us down and tricking us into harming women, tricking us into harming water, tricking us into fear and greed and blah, blah, blah. The way that this spirit like tricks us is to, to, to make us think that other people aren't human. If it can succeed in tricking us, we, we, we have our excuse to subjugate. We have our excuse to eliminate, to exterminate. When they came to the Turtle Island, there was actually trials in Spain to argue about whether or not we were human. And there was this debate in Spain in the 1500s of like, are they human? Because if they are, we can't just brutally kill them. But if they aren't, then we can. And it was like they were searching for this justification. And they decided because we had no Christianity, that therefore we had no soul, and therefore we weren't human. And that is the doctrine of discovery, right? Part of that doctrine of discovery. When I was in Palestine, they would call Palestinians cockroaches. And, and I'm like, I, I, it made my blood boil because I know exactly how that feels. I know exactly how it feels for a U.S. government to come in and literally mow down your people with howitzer guns in the 1800s because you're literally cockroaches to them. I'm not a cockroach. I'm a human being. And furthermore, cockroaches are human beings too. You know? <laughs> but that's another topic for, for, for another second here in a moment. But this idea that, 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 that if we can somehow convince ourselves that somebody's different and therefore they're not human like we are, that gives us that weird little mental justification to obliterate them. And if I, I genuinely think if the powers that be had their way, they would have every Palestinian person disappear from the face of the earth. 100%. That's what they would want. And I'm, I'm not trying to, and, and same with indigenous peoples totally in, the 18, in the 1800s, the project was extermination. That was the policy, plain as day, written in the law. California governor in the late 1800s said, we will exterminate the Indian race until they are no more. You know, he just said it. And so that is something that's hard for us to admit that other that either other people are capable of that or that we ourselves are capable of that. And so the antidote then is to remind people we are human. And my grandfather went to Stanford University. He was one of the first to name in. And I'm like, Grandpa, why are you playing into this? I went to Stanford too, but I was like, why are you playing into this game and going to the colonizers? ivory tower and my mom said lila he had to prove we were human you know and it makes me cry like they couldn't just see we were human we had to we had to jump through all these hoops to say hey we have a brain hey we have a heart hey we're human the animals you know my dog you know he to me he is my relative he's not my underling he's not i'm not his master he is my friend and he is equal. And, and that's the ecocentric worldview that is understanding 
as indigenous peoples, we saw all beings as relatives. The buffalo had their own nation. The Lakota call it the Tatanka Oyate. They had their own nation, Oyate meaning nation. Every animal species was on a nation to nation basis. And so our first task is to see each other as human. That's, you know, that would be great if we could just get that one step down. And then we need to see all other beings as human, as, as, as equal, as people having personhood so that we honor each and every being, not as like, oh, there's just an animal, I can do whatever I want, but th that, that they're equal to us. You just gave me chills because there's something about indigenous cultures that is so central to the philosophy, to, to, to the worldview, which is respect. Respect for everything, right? Not just respect for humanity, it goes way beyond that. It's respect for absolutely everything in existence. And we have so much to learn from them. We have so, so, so much to learn from them. And the opposite of that, you know, the capitalism, colonialism side is disrespect for absolutely everything, whether it be humans, land, environment, whatever it is. Yes. You made me want to go vegan. <laughs> That's not the answer either. <laughs> Oh, you're talking to a woman who like eats. No, beer I was just, I was, I was just kidding. It was a little, it was a little joke. I, I did catch that joke. I did catch. Oh, yeah, that so joke. I'm a, that's that's what I that's what I do on this podcast. Sometimes I just throw out a little joke. Sometimes they work, and sometimes we feel awkward about them. You know what I mean? Okay. I saw on your Instagram that you had an elk stew that you were preparing. Is that a family recipe? Yeah. Well, I have never hunted an elk, and neither has any of my family for me. We've hunted a lot of deer. I actually found the elk in a freezer, but <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a food co-op, but I know that that meat is really good for me. And I know that, you know, as indigenous peoples, it's, it's good for us to eat foods that are from our own land, no matter who we are. And that, you know, sheep, churro, sheep meat would affect my body differently than it would affect yours, Michael would affect yours different Laura yeah so I've really been practicing DNA based diets to uh, like for instance the black tailed deer Lakota people don't eat it it's a taboo it makes them sick there's an enzyme in it and it's also sacred and but then other people can eat it no problem so that's how unique it is and that's another reason why Palestine is it's really important for people to stay on their own land not to say that we can't move around but we should be allowed access to our own land because a lot of the foods that are there are built perfectly for our bodies. We've been co-evolving with them for tens of thousands of years, if not more. And so a lot of indigenous peoples here on Turtle Island, we have obesity issues. We have diabetes. We have really hardcore dietary pains oozing out of our bodies because Either they built a dam and the salmon don't go up anymore and people can't fish anymore. They take away fishing rights and people can't eat this, this specific meat that is literally designed perfectly for their microbiology. They can't have access to it anymore. And furthermore, they're, they're marginalized and dispossessed. So they might live in a food desert now when they have access only to processed foods. So, you know, colonization and food are very obviously influence one another. And it's really important, I think, too, to not only fight for Palestinian access to homeland, but also access to, to traditional foods, because without those, we can literally get sick. Um, and, and that's not fair either. This is reminding me a lot of the conversations that we had with Leila Haddad, who was recently on our show, and we were speaking about the, the siege on Gaza and the effects that it's had on food and what comes into Gaza, what Palestinians in Gaza are able to eat. One of the unfortunate side effects is that olive oil has become a scarcity and that Palestinians in Gaza who have spent, as you mentioned, you know, thousands of years farming olive trees and, and, and pressing their own olive oil, now all of a sudden are making all their traditional dishes with corn oil because they don't have an alternative and because the siege so unjustly constricts so many 
of the foods that they are accustomed to. And of course, I mean, you know, the thing with the fishermen, that also was another great example because Palestinians are restricted to so many kilometers off the shore of Gaza by Israel yet again. And if they exceed what is allowed by the apartheid state, then they will be shot. And Palestinian fishermen are, you know, doing a very dangerous task to be a, a Palestinian fisherman because you're not just, you know, going out with your boat for a nice day on the water. You you have to look out for occupiers that are trying to shoot you while you are trying to bring food home to your families. Even if you do manage to get back to shore, having not been blown out of the water by some naval force, you have a catch. You have a ton of fish, but not a ton of customers because the economy of Gaza has been suppressed so badly that people aren't able to buy fish. Fish is a huge delicacy in a place that's right next to the sea. Layla also talked about how olive oil has been commodified into tiny little packages, right? So they sell it to the people of Gaza in small amounts, and they create unnecessary waste from these plastic packages, which shouldn't be there in the first place. Yeah, I don't know if y'all have interviewed anyone from Tent of Nations. They're a wonderful organization in Palestine, and they have this, you know, special property, and they had all these olive trees. And I was very fortunate to be able to, to visit them and to spend time with them. Beautiful people, beautiful people. And, and, you know, those people who like just love in the face of hatred for decades, even when people, you know, harass them, attack them, they had these olive oil orchards that had been ransacked and attacked and cut. And these, some of these olive trees were 30 years old, 40 years old. And they said something similar. They said, these are not just trees. These are our relatives. And I was like, wow, they see the world the way we as native people see the world. They said, these are, our, these are not trees. These are my children. Same way you'd see your own children. So when they hacked down, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of olive trees, it hurts in the same way. Of course, people wouldn't understand that, like, it's just a tree. But to them, it hurts in the same way as if you killed somebody's children. And the amount of time it takes to, to, to grow them. And, and what did they do? They just planted them again and started over. And it's beautiful in this tragic way. You know, my doctoral work, my PhD work is in indigenous food systems. So I'm always nerding out on that. But it's important. People don't understand the depth to which our, our traditional foods keep us alive. Like I might be Diné, but if I'm not eating churro sheep, if I'm not eating sumac, if I'm not eating uh, corn from our heirlooms, I'm not what makes me Diné. My body isn't Diné. It's starting to deteriorate. And so the breath of the sheep actually stimulates my microbiology in a way that a European sheep would not. And what, here's the real kicker, my breath stimulates their microbiology. So we actually don't just need the sheep, the sheep actually need us. They need us to be around them. And if we're apart, it literally breaks what creator has made. It breaks that family that we actually needed each other on. And people, so people don't understand the, 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 the complexity to which people being in constant interaction with their traditional homelands and the species of those, uh, what it can do to someone. And that goes for Euro-Americans too. You know, who knows what they've gone through being divorced from their, their traditional foods. You mentioned sumac. That's yes. That's we share. Really? Yes. Tell me more. Did you know that Palestine's national dish, it's a, it's, it's a roasted chicken called imsechen. And the primary spice that is in this dish is sumac. Oh, that's so beautiful. Yes. yes. Yeah, we have a little orangish red berry that we call yeah. sumac and it helps Same. us. Yeah. And then other people can't eat it. It makes them sick. So it's, you know, the Euro-Americans are like, oh, choke cherries are bad for you. They're going to kill you. And it's like, uh, we've been eating these for thousands of years. But 
in a way they're right. Cause they can't eat them. They can't metabolize them. They can't. So it's so important each and every, no matter who we are, no matter what skin color we have, no matter where we're from, no matter what language we speak, we're connected to these foods. And it's, it's such a tragedy when the process of colonization, it's, it's like breaking a family apart. There's really no difference. That's the issue with not just the FDA, but the medical industry using a white man's body as the standard for all food, for all caloric needs, for all mineral and nutritional needs. It's like, they don't understand that DNA matters and we're all different and that's beautiful. That's how creator made us. And we're all just as unique as the ecosystems that we, we were raised in. So you've also spoken about how native people became a sustainable culture sustainable in their spiritual and their ecological behavior. And when I saw this interview, I was intrigued by the use of the word sustainable to describe a culture, because I always say on the Palestine pod that Zionism is an unsustainable ideology and that apartheid is an unsustainable form of governance. And to me, I think that's because I believe that man was born free. And since freedom is our natural state, that we will always incline towards it. So can you share with us what you feel makes a society sustainable? Wow, that's really deep what you just said and really in line with what certain elders have taught me. This idea that we have an inherent nature, not only to be free, but to be equal. And this idea that creator made us equal. And so when we deviate, from or if we live as if we are not, it cannot stand on creation because creation was created to equal. And so I'll just give an example to tr- make my words less abstract. In the state of New Mexico, there's an archaeological site called Chaco Canyon, and everybody's very excited about it and proud of it. And they, you know, tourists go to it all the time. But we as Diné people, we don't go back there because that is where we messed up. We have, we had huge houses with incredible masonry, stone walls, you know, wooden Vega frames. I mean, it was, they're beautiful, you know, buildings, but who built those buildings? You know, it was actually a caste system that the quote unquote underlings built up these houses for the priests and the higher castes. And it got really ugly there. I mean, really wrong. And so they say creator sent us a drought to give us the courage to change and that the youth were like, no more of this. And and we disbanded. One of the things I heard someone say is that the reason why creator sent that drought was because of the inequity that was going on there, that that is just not what creator intended this world for. And people might think I'm crazy or overly spiritual, whatever, but I do believe every single hierarchical civilization that's ever had its heyday on this planet has always gone down in flames. I'm not trying to be me, but what's beautiful about going down in flames is people learn. And we never go back there because as a symbol that we never want to revert to that type of living ever again. And we have evolved, we have learned something, we have grown. And so now when you look at Diné people, Pueblo people, who arguably descend from Chaco Canyon, we're so egalitarian now. We're super chill. <laughs> we're like, we take care of each other. We believe in the laws of interdependence and we're not perfect. You know, we still have some tribal divisions and stuff, but the idea of ajoba, meaning humility, gentleness, kindness, idea of eh, you know, kinship, being there for one another, playing your role correctly as a father, mother, daughter, auntie, grandpa, grandchild. We all have our roles and that's all embodied in, in or rather symbolized by the word ke, or the word nehemana hasan, you know, our mother, the earth, seeing her as, as a mother. All of these beautiful words came to us from collapse. It was collapse that engendered this understanding. It was collapse that gifted us this knowledge of like, okay, don't do that again. You know, and I'm hoping and praying that this global collapse we are about to experience 
and indeed in many places already are experiencing through catastrophic fire, drought, et cetera, is going to humble humanity like we've never been humbled before. And it's going to humble us this time on a global scale. You know, civilizations have risen and fallen all over many continents. But I think this is the first time we're all going to fall on our faces together. And it's going to suck. I mean, I'm, I don't think there's any two ways about it. It's not going to be fun. But that I think we will rise out of this, be it in 100 years or 200 years, much wiser people. And we're going to be like, look, if you dabble in that hierarchy, that idea that we are supreme over nature, that men are supreme over women, that white folks are, that any race is supreme over any other race, you will literally destroy the planet, which is what we've done, like the whole planet. So don't do that again, you know, but we are learning that we're in the crucible of education right now. A lot of what you're mentioning, I think is touching on climate change. And when we think about climate change and how it interacts with colonialism, there's a couple of you know points I'd love to get your your thoughts on. So in Palestine, the colonizer has prevented Palestinians from picking our native plants. So for example, we're not allowed to pick zafar, which is one of our major food staples in our breakfast. They've outlawed that for us. One of the things that they have done in order to erase the trace of the Palestinian civilization following the Nakba was the Jewish National Fund covered the landscape of Palestine with hundreds of millions of trees that are not indigenous to Palestine. They brought in trees from anywhere else in the world, but they don't fit into our landscape and topography. And these trees that they have planted, on the one hand, they are marketing them as being some sort of like this, oh, plant a tree in Israel, it's very eco-friendly, and you know, you can plant a tree, donate, whatever, you know, donate a gift to your friend, a tree in Israel, whatever it may be. These 250 million pine trees that the JNF has planted in Palestine have actually turned into a major fire hazard in Palestine. Most years, hundreds of fires break out after the summer droughts exacerbated, of course, by the disastrous effects of climate change. And environmentalists say that the dark canopies of trees that Israel has planted in these very arid regions, such as the Negev, absorb heat, unlike the unforested light-colored soil. And when they are short of water, the slow growing trees actually capture little carbon. So they're having disastrous effects on the environment. When they're painted as being pro-environment, and in reality, their purpose is something so much more nefarious, which is to erase the trace of Palestinian life in Palestine and make it look like it was essentially a land without people, which is the famous Zionist sort of cliche. That's a process called greenwashing. So I think it's interesting how the settler colony has used trees as a weapon against Palestinian society. They're actually even using the planting of trees as a weapon to push out Bedouin communities today, uh, until today. Obviously it's had a disastrous effect on, on, on native species of brush and animal habitats. So I'd love to hear your thoughts about this interaction between the environment and colonialism and how so-called environmentally friendly measures may in fact be not so environmentally friendly when you actually study what their effect is having. Well, let me first speak on the idea of erasing a prior inhabitant's history to legitimize your new settlement. There is a Latin phrase called terra nullius, which means no man's land. And that was the phrase used by many European quote unquote explorers who came here and reported back home that this was terra nullius, empty land, no man's land. And that is very untrue. This was densely populated land, which is why my PhD research is kind of political in a way because I'm proving we not only had food systems, we planted entire forests. We managed forests, we managed the Chesapeake Bay oyster population for 10,000 years straight without ever just depleting them. We managed entire, the whole state of Washington and Oregon was routinely burned by indigenous 
uh, prescribed burners for thousands of years. Great Plains was managed with fire. The buffalo followed our fire. We didn't follow the buffalo. We arguably created the Oglala Aquifer through our firing, which increases the soil infiltration rate of water, which brings water down. So the, the idea that people weren't here is very convenient. It's very similar to the idea that the people didn't have souls or that the people weren't people. Because if nobody was here, then you didn't steal any land from anyone, right? So it's very much in the interest of the conscience of a colonizer to fool others and even themselves to think that they didn't take anyone's land because nobody was here. And that is very much a very real thing that happens, not just in Turtle Island or in Palestine, but other places as well. So there's that. Now, jumping into your piece about ecological colonization, the, I, I did see those pine trees when I was in Palestine. And our, our guide did say, hey, you know, they wanted to bring these pine trees here because it reminded them of home where these specific families were from. And obviously there were other reasons too, but the idea was to make it their own uh, previous homeland. And so the, the issue, again, goes back to what I was saying with the sheep, of the, the, that their very breath activates my microbiome and my lungs and my gut in a way that no one else can. So think of what happens when these trees, which are from Europe, or I don't know where these pine trees are from, but they're from very far away. They are attuned perfectly. Those pine trees are not the villains in this story. They're just the tools used by folks who aren't thinking with their heart. But the, these, these pine trees are meant for a very specific biome. And when you bring them out of that and into a completely new place, you're influencing things that we don't even really understand completely. This very special plant that you're talking about, which has an intimate relationship with the people who've been eating it for thousands of years. And again, those people, the plant needs the people. <laughs> it needs us to pick it. It needs us to harvest it. It needs us to breathe on it, to walk around it, to to emit our pheromones. I mean, it's so complex, more than any ecological scientist really admit sometimes, although some, some fields are getting into it. And so when you disrupt things like this, it has cascading effects. So let's talk about the, the Turtle Island uh, context. Obviously the fur trade, right? They loved them beavers. They killed our relatives by the millions. Again, these are not just beavers. They're not just pests or animals. These are our relatives. These are our people arguably. When you kill them by the millions, guess what? They make dams. And guess what? When you kill them, those dams go away. These small scale dams and these little dams create ponds. And these little ponds create habitat for a bajazillion species. And the moose come there to drink and et cetera, et cetera. You take out one piece of the ecosystem, you have no idea what you're doing. The, most people, a lot of these folks didn't understand that they can't just come in like a Lego set and be like, I'm going to pull this out and put this in and then put a little home over here. It's like, you have to be a little bit gentle and cognizant of, of the system that is playing out and has been playing out for millennia. These are localized systems. They're not really systems that can handle abrupt change like that. Change happens slowly and these systems can absorb that change slowly. But when you just wipe out a whole species like the beaver or the buffalo, you know, we all know the, the tragic story of the, of the buffalo relatives. We killed Custer and they, then America retaliated by killing the buffalo. They were going to kill the buffalo anyways, but, you know, that made them more upset of like, oh, yeah, well, how about this? Boom. And when you take out a single species from an ecosystem, there's no telling what kind of consequences that can have. Not only is the environment and environmental causes being used as a means to further colonialism, but another aspect of this sort of environmental colonialism is actually that Native and Palestinian communities are being prevented from adapting to climate change. I was looking into the work of Suha Jarrar, who tragically passed away last week, the daughter of 
the infamous Palestinian political prisoner Khalida Jarrar. And Soha Jarrar was working at Al Haq, which is one of the uh, Palestinian human rights organizations on the ground. And her focus, her research was actually focused on the environmental consequences of Israeli apartheid and occupation. One of the reports that she co authored actually focused on climate change adaptation under occupation and climate change vulnerability in the occupied Palestinian territories. And the report essentially concludes that Palestinians residing in climatically vulnerable areas, it was focused primarily on the occupied West Bank and in particular in Area C, those Palestinians are precluded from applying basic community-based adaptation options without the genuine realization of the collective right of the Palestinian people to self-determination, including permanent sovereignty over their natural wealth and resources. So there's also this notion that part of colonial violence is preventing a people from taking the natural measures that are sort of needed in a time of crisis to respond to that crisis. And the report details many of the discriminatory policies and practices of Israel that are imposed on the occupied West Bank, everything related to you know, restriction of movement and restriction of various aspects of daily life that make Palestinians more and more vulnerable to climate change and prevents them from actually responding to climate change in a way that makes sense. I thought that was interesting and I was wondering if there was any sort of corollary from Turtle Island? Well, I think the most obvious corollary is, is displacement and relocation. Oklahoma is a, is a colonial state within the state of, of the United States. And uh, it was tragically, like some people call it a dumping ground where massive nations, I mean, like the Cahokia nation who was like just gigantic civilizations with hundreds of thousands of people doing incredible management work in their areas, which is like Cahokia has now become St. Louis, Missouri, but in any case, taken and dumped, well, beaten and battered and, and genocided and, and measled. And then the survivors were taken to Oklahoma. And we're talking gigantic civilizations of indigenous peoples, nations, beautiful languages, ideas, ecological strategies, artwork, basketry, weaving, I mean, just phenomenal cultures reduced to these little tiny reservations on, in Oklahoma where there's like 2,000 people left and the language is extinct, you know? Like, and so how do a people adapt to climate crisis? when they are so disoriented, when their language has been stripped from them? How do a people adapt when they have been dispossessed and then stolen from again and again and stripped again and again until they don't have the economic power to adapt to a climate crisis? And not only that, but not only is their language stripped from them, but then their command of the English language is compromised because they've been given substandard education in these boarding schools. So that's one of the things of these boarding schools is it wasn't just to destroy their own culture, but to not even give them access to any language or, or uh, ability to function in the dominant, quote unquote, dominant culture either. So this, this displacement of the Cahokia descendants, just one example, and the relocation and the disorientation and, and the decimation of, of numbers. And that is something that I'm like, how on earth, like even if land back happened and they were given St. Louis back, they wouldn't even know what to do with it. And that's not their fault. They'd probably know better what to do with it than the people who are currently in St. Louis. But the, the really in-depth ecological knowledge has very sadly in many cases, I can't speak for Cahokia descendants completely, but in, in a lot of our tribes cases has been completely wiped out. And that's just a really effing sad thing and true thing. And so a lot of our traditional ecological knowledge is sustained 
we have a few oases throughout Turtle Island where it's, it's alive, sometimes just barely alive, but it's alive. Maybe it's been fragmented, maybe it's been compromised, but it's still there. And so those islands we must protect because those are the islands who have the knowledge of how to adapt to climate crisis, who have the knowledge to mitigate a climate crisis. And so that's a big thing I would say, just, you know, relocation. I mean, folks who were put into Gaza, I mean, they, not only are they not in their specific ecosystem that they were in, because, you know, they might not be coastal people, they might have been more inland people. But even in Gaza, it's been ecologically destroyed because there's so many people in one spot that even if they had the traditional ecological knowledge of that coastal area, it might not be able to be pursued anymore, especially when they're not allowed to fish, right? So, you know, it's just, it's just a, that disorienting effect. The Romans, that was, their, that was their big tactic, was relocating people. They would take people in Europe over here and throw them over here, and take people over here and throw them over there. And it's a very, very powerful and, and efficient tactic. If you're trying to overtake a people in their land, you just disorient them. And I think that's the biggest piece that's, that we need to, to reorient as Indigenous peoples to be able to help ourselves and even our own colonizers from, from basically planetary destruction. You've also spoken a lot about the importance of going back to the land. So I know that land back maybe is not the complete solution because of the destruction that has been happening for centuries, but it still is a primary focus. And you've spoken about it as a means to heal the intergenerational trauma. And of course, immediately I think of the right of return of Palestinian refugees and how in our culture, it doesn't matter where you were born or where you were made a refugee, whether you're an internally displaced refugee within Palestine, like as you mentioned, the people of Gaza who 80% of them are not from Gaza, they're actually from the land which is now called Israel, but they were expelled from that land and pushed down into Gaza in 1948 during the Nakba, or whether you're a Palestinian in a refugee camp somewhere else in the Arab world, or whether you're a Palestinian like myself who's further in exile in the West, there's one thing that all Palestinians have in common, which is that we all know where we are from in Palestine. We all know which city we're from. We all know where our grandparents are from. We all know where our great grandparents are from and so on. And I, it reminded me, I was scrolling through Instagram and I saw a video of a Nakba survivor and she was sitting in a refugee camp in Jordan, I believe. And she was a very elderly lady and she was sitting with her great grandchildren. And the only thing she kept telling them over and over again is you have to go back to Yaffa. You have to go back to Yaffa. And, you know, to the point where it became a game. And she said, where are you going back? And the kids would shout Yaffa, you know? Of course, now today it's known as Tel Aviv, but this is where they were from. And this is where they were violently uprooted from. And for the great grandmother, that's, you know, it's sort of like a one track mind. It's like the only thing that matters is to go back to where we came from to go back to where we were expelled from. And that is being transmitted generation after generation. We've talked about it with Palestinians in exile, you know, like myself and others, uh, like Dr. Steve Salida, if we were afforded actually the opportunity to exercise our right of return, so many of us would do it. And, you know, we've been divorced from Palestine for three generations now, but so many of us would do it because I grew up with Arabic as my first language. I grew up with Palestinian food as the first food that I, that I ate. My grandparents spoke only Arabic to me. My grandparents' culture is, is Palestinian Arabic culture. This is what I know. Same with my, with my own parents. This is, this is the only thing that I know in every other culture that I have grown up in or lived in, whether it be in the United States or in Europe or wherever it may be, has been a foreign culture to me. It's not my culture. And I, I, and I can fit into it, but it's, it's, still, it's still not where I'm from. And so that to me is something which I really, really resonated with me when you spoke about the, the healing of going back to the land and how I feel like if Palestinians were finally afforded the opportunity to exercise their right of return, so much of the trauma that has happened to us and that we are currently continuing to live would immediately be lifted off of us. 
Yes, there would still be so many problems to solve. Yes, we still have to, you know, fight for equal rights and everything, but just give us the opportunity to go back. And, and, and I, and I, and I, I mean, I, I feel like that in and of itself would do so much. Yes. And it's really healing hearing you say that because as, you know, Dene woman, we've, my family left, not because we were forced out, but because we were shamed out, we were shamed and told, you know, these people are dirty on the reservation and you don't want to live on a, in, wrapped in a blanket. And, you know, you have to use an outhouse and da, da, da. And it's like, actually, that's a lot more comfortable the way of living actually in many ways, but we were shamed out. And my grandfather went to Stanford and he like sent my mom to Exeter and he sent me to Stanford. And I'm, you know, like trying to basically force us away from our own roots because the white society is so much quote unquote better. But no matter which way you are divorced from your roots, whether it's by force or shamed out of them, obviously that didn't work for me. I I love who I am and I'm learning my language and I'm bringing the ceremonies back and all that. But no matter what way you're divorced from it, the longer you spend away from it, the harder it is to go back. That's the sad thing is that because you intermarry, right? You intermarry maybe not with a, a Diné person. My, my mom's Diné, my father's mostly European. So I'm pretty much half European. If I don't marry a Diné man, my kids will be like, quote unquote, one fourth, you know? And then once they start living in other cities, will they ever be able to acclimate? You know, my first language was not Diné Bizad. My first language was English. But you're in the same situation as like my great grandma was. You know, like we're in these different stages. And if, if the Israeli state can manage to keep people away long enough, I feel like sometimes it makes it harder and harder to return. And so I really hope that that grandma's great grandchildren get back home. And I'm so grateful that she's helping them understand who they are and where they're from, because we weren't always able to do that here. A lot of us don't even... We've never been to a ceremony in our life. We've never spoken a word of our own language in our life. We've never eaten one traditional food because we've been, they've been at it for 500 years and we're, we're hanging on by a thread in most cases. And luckily I had parents who said, you know, you are Dene, that matters and don't ever forget it. And, and I will always tell my children the same. So beautiful. Thank you so much for that. And you're absolutely right. That's that's like sort of the tragic reality, which is what happens generations from now? Will it just be lost because we've been away for so long? The good news is Zionists say that they can come back after 3,000 years. So, hey, 3,000 years, we'll be using the same <laughs> argument. They keep us away for that long. <laughs> <laughs> so you have been to Palestine and you've been very vocal, at least within the context of the global intifada of unity about your support for Palestinian liberation. So I've taken a look through your Instagram account and you've made a, a few posts supporting Palestinians and supporting Palestinian liberation. I'm curious to know when you first learned about Palestine and once you did, why you felt it was important to speak out about this struggle, realizing that in a lot of cases, you can speak about any liberation struggle you want, as long as you don't touch Palestine. That's when, you know, there starts to be consequences, at least if you're doing so in the United States. You have, as you know, religious incentive for people to, to create Israel and maintain it. You have economic incentive you have military incentive and you have not just the religious incentive of this prophecy of Jesus isn't coming back until Jewish folks go back. And this, that's a really intense prophecy and it has the entire Christian world, which is a big world mobilized behind Israel. And in my opinion, they are fooling Christians. They are exploiting Christians and they're using Christians to create this state, which is actually for other purposes, not to help Jesus come back. It's to, to create a military foothold. It's to help with the oil extraction, the economic thing. It's not about Jesus coming back. So you have that religious incentive, right? Of like, if we don't, Jesus won't come back until Israel exists. 
in a strong way or something. And, and Lord knows they want Jesus to come back. I want Jesus to come back. And the other, the other religious incentive is again, this dehumanization of, of Islam that because there have been folks who have done violent things who have been in Islam, then therefore all of Islam is bad. And not only that, but they're a threat, you know, ancient wounds, ancient divisions, <laughs> you know, and that's coyote, right? They're, they're descending from the same father and turning these, the children of, of, that, of Abraham against each other. And, and it's just all of you. So there's, there's many reasons why it's hard to speak out in support of Palestine. There is a huge, and I mean, <laughs> billions of people, big force that wants me to shut the heck up, you know? And so, yes, it is, it is a little daunting speaking for Palestine, but I love how certain politicians have shown you can do it and you're still alive, <laughs> like uh, Ilhan Omar and AOC. So going back to your original question of, you know, when did I first learn about Palestine? I was in Switzerland. It was 2013. And I was at a conference for peace, infrastructures of peace, because they have departments of defense and ministries of war. But where are the departments of peace and the ministries of peace? Sort of creating these governmental bodies whose job is to create peace rather than to create war. So very interesting conference about this very topic. There was a, a man there from Gaza who came to, to be with us. And he took us to lunch one day and he just talked to us for like an hour. And when I say us, I think there was like three of us at the table. And he wrote on a little napkin, like the map of Israel and the map of Gaza and, and what he had experienced just to get there, you know. And, and literally in one hour, this man, the beautiful man, who creates movie nights for children in Gaza because his whole goal is for Gaza children to be able to be children. He's like, he's tired of these kids basically not knowing what it means to be a child because they're getting invaded and bombed every other, you know, whatever time period. He cares about his people. His little sister at the time was eight years old. He said she had already experienced three full on military invasions as a child. And he said, the scariest thing is when his mom said, I don't know if we're going to make this, you know? And he said, his mom is the strongest person in the world. He knows. And to see his own mother shaking and say, I don't know if we're going to make it through this one, you know, is, is something that, that really, that he shouldn't have to live with. He told us about how they suspend rations on Jewish holidays so that the rations don't even get into Gaza. So that even the crappy food that they can eat they're not, there's no, not even that to eat. He talked about how the Israeli soldiers escorted him out of Gaza to get to Switzerland and they wouldn't let his feet touch the ground because his feet were too dirty to touch Israel. I mean, on and on and on. And anyone who speaks to a Palestinian for an hour <laughs> you know, will basically be like, wow, this is so sad. And all of our relatives you know, stuck in this little place of Gaza, it's just, it just makes you wonder how it could still be happening. Like, how could another day go by that this is happening? And so I think that had really opened my eyes of like, wow, I don't know what I can do, but I would like to do something. And I still feel a little paralyzed most days of like, what the heck are we gonna do? There's so much power holding this structure in place. And so I praise little efforts like this to educate and to help people to help people know a little bit more about what's going on. Yeah. Just to reassure you, you said billions of people. It's probably only billions of Twitter users. You know what I mean? It's uh it's probably about 30,000 actual people. Yeah. They have they have a lot of bots. Really? What I mean by and, that is a billion Christians, billions of Christians on the planet who are. Oh, I see. I see. Got you. Actively fooled, in my opinion, into believing yes. that, this, that the Israeli state must exist for Christ yep. to come back. 
they, yeah. they do the same thing with Jews, right? They use Judaism, they manipulate the trauma of Judaism, and it's actually a part of the dehumanization that you were talking about earlier. A old Israeli philosopher, Yeshua Leibowitz, talked about the dehumanization that needs to take place in order for the continued ethnic cleansing, the continued genocide of a people to happen without the settlers really thinking about it or thinking that they're doing anything wrong. And he described Judeo-Nazis is the term that he used. And that was a long time ago. And to that end, there were actually in Jewish history, there has been instances where Jews collaborated with our own oppressors. They were called capos. They oversaw Jews in the Nazi death camps for elevated status, improved conditions, and access to resources. In the workforce, there have been capitalist Jews who took advantage of Jewish and Italian immigrants as a labor force and ultimately ended up killing them in the Triangle Shirtwaist factory because of the working conditions. Among the large pantheon of Native communities, are there instances where these events sound familiar to you? Well, if you corner a people and you basically say you can have death or death, that's not a choice. So you can call these people traitors or betrayers of their own people or their own humanity, but is that really a choice? And so I, for one, and people may disagree with me as they often do, I have compassion for people, and it reminds me of the huelde, which in our language means uh, the place of suffering. It's a concentration camp where about uh, 12,000 Diné people were, were held outside of Albuquerque, New Mexico, and we were, we were imprisoned there for four years. And in these places, the, the water was controlled by the soldiers. So, you know, we were, again, relocated, disoriented, and the women had their children there, you know, they, they carried every man, woman, and child and elder who could make the death march. You know, so many died along the way, but the ones who made it, they were men, women, and children in that camp. If the women wanted water for their children, they would have to sleep with the soldiers in their barracks. They used water as a leverage. And so is that a choice? You know, <laughs> is that a choice to, did she choose to sleep with her soldier? Or did her, was her family's life on the line? And I'm not saying every person who leveraged the capitalist system to get wealthy and betrayed their own people or what have you is in that same situation. But I would be careful to, to, to keep demonizing each other and saying, oh, well, these, these Jewish folks sided with the Nazis because they just wanted a better situation. You know, like you have, we cannot judge what situation those people were in. It's like, do you want to side with us or do you want your kids to get killed? You know, basically, what they're, that's not a choice. We just cannot judge each other. And that's just my opinion. Many people disagree. But there's so much going on and there's so much we judge ourselves for. But it's really good to be able to discern, like, did I really choose that? Or did the world kick me, punch me, and my grandparents, and my great-grandparents, and my great-great-grandparents to the point where my generation was so beaten down that I didn't have very many options at all? That's a very compassionate-based understanding. And I truly laud you for the ability to be compassionate in the moment as it's happening. I will say, though, that there were Jews who decided they were going to basically become suicide bombers, right? And take out as many Nazis as they could have. And the Capos had that option too, and they didn't choose it. But what you were saying is such a brilliant way to view the world. And I actually saw you speak about it where you practice forgiveness, right? And how that can sometimes happen in the moment, even when there's not any room for closure. And I was just wondering if you could expand upon that. Yeah, I think that process is more important than outcome. Although sometimes I am not as true to that as I wish I was in the sense that standing rock. Okay. The outcome we quote unquote lost the pipeline went in the ground, the oil started flowing. That river is in more danger than it already was, but the process by which we fought was where the victory lives. We never raised a weapon. We never harmed anyone. We 
fought with prayer. We were praying for those people in the helicopters riding over us every day. We were, <laughs> I've never seen so many people pray for water, for themselves, for the descendants and their own enemies all at the same time. Just a strong prayer. That doesn't mean we backed down. We never backed down. We were right there all day long until they literally threw us out with automatic weapons. We changed the way the world thinks about water. We changed the way the world thinks about indigenous peoples, reminding people who we are, what we stand for. We brought together things that had been divided for centuries. We brought 400 clergy to burn the doctrine of discovery in our sacred fire. Even if that alone was the only thing that happened, that's a win. <laughs> and so other people say the other way, like, who cares how we get there? We just got to get there. I don't care who I kill. I don't care if a Nazi dies. As long as I get there, I win. I operate the other way. How we fight is where the victory is, not in the outcome of the fight. If I win St. Louis back for the Cahokia descendants, but I have to kill a whole city of St. Louisians, that doesn't, that's not a win. And so forgiveness to me is about how we fight. A lot of it has to do with compassion and understanding. And a lot of it has to do with something that's completely insane, which is the clearing of a debt that's owed to you. It's never, forgiveness is never going to make sense. It's never going to mathematically compute. If someone owes you $2,000, they owe you $2,000. If you forgive that debt, it's never going to make sense. But that's what it is. That's what forgiveness is. You're literally clearing a debt that is clearly and fairly owed to you. In the indigenous case, <laughs> you know, we are owed immeasurable. You killed our entire race. You destroyed our buffalo relatives. You poisoned our water. You raped our women. You killed our children and disembodied them and, and mutilated their bodies at Sand Creek Massacre. You unspeakable things. The, the University of Denver had a book in a case up until the 1970s that was bound in human flesh, our flesh, 1970s, University of Denver. We have so much people owe us. It's, it's at this point, you couldn't even count it all. That doesn't mean we don't deserve our land. We don't deserve our rights. It means we are choosing to love these people in the face of all they've done to us. And we are choosing to love them and not hold it against them. It sounds insane because it is. It will never make sense. But that's what I want to strive to do every day, particularly because it was what was done for me. I started doing drugs when I was 11. I was a drug addict at age 20 and a drug dealer. I was at Stanford being a complete idiot. And somehow the elders picked me up and said, we love you. <laughs> I was like, why the heck do you love me? I mean... I'm the last person you should ask to join your fight for liberation and love and truth. The last person. I've been hurting people for years just as I was hurt. And somehow they said, you know what? We clear that. We want you on our team. Hop on. And I said, okay, let's do it. I'm reminded of the phrase, don't become a monster in fighting a monster. Yeah, that's a big one. I think in Palestine, there was a man who told me something about a scorpion. It was basically the same exact thing, but it was about a scorpion. This is a Palestinian man, you know, who's been through in, everything you can imagine. In Jewish history, we'd say, don't become Goliath while trying to fight him. Yeah. And you might say, I know many have said this before, and I know it's very painful for some Jewish folks to hear this idea of like, you know, how ironic is it that Gaza is a concentration camp? You know, how ironic is that? Is that an accident? And I know that's really painful for folks to hear, but if you don't forgive your oppressor, they say you can become your oppressor. It's actually not strange for me to hear at all. I know for a fact they've replicated the same system because the Israeli military studied the Warsaw Ghetto from a strategical perspective so that they could replicate the same things onto the Palestinians. Yes. And I had a feeling you wouldn't feel bad. You've studied this and I thank you for your, your, I mean, gosh, it's really cool to work with both of you at the same time. I'm so honored to be in your presence and everything that you've said has been so enlightening. I have one more question, if you'll humor me. Yep. From the perspective of a 
white settler colonialist, which I am on your native land, what's the best way for someone like me to become involved in a land back movement? One is to give your land back. (laughs) (laughs) You can get like literally or give your church's land back. There's been some churches who have given huge hundreds of acres back. Another is to invest in indigenous capacity building to be able to take the land back. That's actually what I'm doing is I'm, let's say like the Black Hills were given to the Lakota tomorrow. We need some capacity building because we have not had it for so long. We need to learn, we not not necessarily how to take care of it. We already know that, but just some leadership building, any support you can do to Native youth and leadership building is a part of land back in my opinion. Third, there's this really interesting thing called the voluntary land tax which is being implemented in the Bay Area called the Shumi land tax. So anyone who lives in Ohlone territory calculates their yearly tax that they must pay to the Ohlone, obviously voluntarily, because we're never going to probably be able to force America to pay us taxes. Who knows? Maybe we will. But you calculate it. It's anywhere between five and $200 a year. It's like not even that much. And they put it into a trust called the Segorate Land Trust. It's called the Shumi land tax. I think we should implement that in every city where wherever we are, everyone who's squatting on indigenous land, which most of us are, we need to pay retribution each year to whatever community. So then again, capacity building, there needs to be a transparent and responsible indigenous body that receives those payments and turns them into community development in a good way. That's another piece that we on the indigenous side have to get our act together of like, okay, can we really handle $200,000 a year through this tax thing? And how are we going to handle it? So again, investing in indigenous leadership, supporting indigenous leaders. And fourthly, I think there's sort of a movement within the movement of land back to sort of stiff arm people to give their money back and just scare them and shame them. I don't think that's going to work, unfortunately. I think most of the land back stuff that is successful and has been successful is going to be collaborative and it's going to be working with each other, which is very hard to do in a cross-cultural context because we annoy the crap out of each other. You know, we don't understand each other, but if we can work together to do models of land back, that will inspire more and more and more. I don't think we're going to force the U.S. government to give us any land. That's just, they're just not going to. They have more guns than we do. They have more political power than we do. That's just my opinion. People might disagree. That's great if they do. I think we need to work where there is willingness and really tap those low-hanging fruits and build a movement out of it and show people, look, this is a thing. It works. And of course, lastly, I would say these funds, if you're a financial capital person, if you know how to raise money, you know, just buying it back is sometimes a really good option too. They've done that here in Alabama, Marcus Cloud and, and their crew has got like hundreds of acres back. Granted, Alabama land is very cheap, but he's bringing back sturgeon. He's bringing back the Southern bison. He's bringing back all this, he's bringing fire back to the land the way we used to do low intensity burns. So that's the last way is like capital building. If you know how to do that and then finding the right indigenous leaders who are going to take that capital in a, in a good way and bring it to the land and to the people. That's, that's the last big way. That was beautiful. And a great place to wrap the episode. Lila June, thank you so much for coming on the Palestine pod. We so appreciate your wisdom your insight, all of the stories from the elders that you've relayed. Everything is so important and it also is so relevant to Palestine. Thank you all to our listeners for listening to another episode. You can find all of our sources at www.palestinepod.com. Follow us on Instagram at the Palestine pod and reach out to us at palestinepod at gmail.com. That's been another episode of the Palestine pod. Thank you all so much. Have a great day. Yeah. And can I just tell you while you're doing this that yeah. as a Palestinian, every time I see an indigenous person posting about Palestine, it gives me so much strength. And I just want to extend mm. that solidarity 
and love back to you and your community because it's just further proof that we're on the right side of history because mm. we have the validation from the people who have been through it. It's like the same thing when we, when we hear about anti-apartheid South Africans that are supporting us, they know what we've been through because they've already been through it. Mm. So yeah, I just, I really appreciated that and reading through your Instagram and seeing some of the posts about Palestine really warm my heart. So that's so interesting to me. Thank you for explaining that to me because it's so important. I think you're helping me understand just how precious it is for us to support y'all. I mean, I always, it, it, there's something, can you say why that is again? Cause we, yeah. So it's, I mean, the thing is, is, you know, settler colonialism better than anyone, right? That's, okay. that's been your experience. It's validating. Years. And what Palestinians say is that we are fighting settler colonialism in Palestine, although it's only existed for 73 some years, right? Mm -hmm. Zionism, Zionist project, Israel is a 73 year old project. It's not right. hundreds of years old, right? It's young in terms of a settler colony. It's created so much destruction, mm -hmm. but it's young in terms of a settler colony, but it's using all of the same practices mm -hmm. that settler colonists have been using in the United States. When we, we actually brought on Dr. Steve Salaita on the podcast, and he's a scholar of native studies and he's a Palestinian American. Mm -hmm. And he has an interesting story. He was actually fired from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign for making posts, uh, Twitter posts against Israel's assaults on Gaza several years ago. But he was supposed to be the chair of Native Studies and Indigenous Studies. So how crazy it is that tweets against settler colonialism is what got him fired. But that's what it's about. It's about having the support and solidarity of the people who know the oppression that we are going through, who have lived through it, who have experience with it, and who are looking at our situation and saying, you're living what we have lived through or what we continue to live through. It's the same thing. It's a validation because the Zionists will tell us that it's not a settler colony. They will tell us that it's not apartheid. They will tell us that they're not expelling us when they are expelling us. They will at once say that we don't exist and then bulldoze our houses and uproot our olive trees. You know, they'll mm -hmm. say the land was empty, but then they'll cover our villages with trees, you know, and change the entire landscape. So what gaslighting. Yeah. On top of that, they will adopt the language of native communities. They claim that they are indigenous simply because Judaism as a religion emanates from that region. Right. It has nothing to do with the actual definition of indigeneity, which is a relationship to the land and to colonialism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's that's the thing. And I mean, that's why Native and Palestinian solidarity is something I'm very interested in because we're fighting settler colonialism and settler colonialism isn't new. It's existed plenty before Palestine. Palestine is just one of the most recent emanations of it. Mm -hmm. And I think that that drives Zionists insane because mm -hmm. they so badly want to have your solidarity. They're never <laughs> going to get it, but they so badly want it because yeah. they would validate, it would validate their project. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I'll show you one thing real quick. So these guys had standing rock posters in their rooms. Yeah. This is Ramallah. Yes. I mean, yeah, so they were like, oh, yeah, I totally have a standing rock flag in my room. I was like, whoa, that is so crazy. I like, I was just so, um, I was so surprised that they uh, knew who we were. Um, Everything you're saying about the creator, about Coyote, about all this, it resonates so much with Islam. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. and I'm sure Muslims have told you this. No, so, I mean, every culture has a Coyote. Whether, you know, the, some yeah, people call it like Satan yeah. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. the Christians, the Christians make it real scary. And we're like, no, it's just a he's little weak. coyote. He's weak. Yeah, he's weak. That's why yeah. he needs us. I think in Buddhism, they call it Mara or mm -hmm. something. But yeah, every culture recognizes that there's a being that's trying to wreak havoc on the earth. And it's not creator. It's a creation like us, yeah. but it's pissed off at creator. <laughs> I love it. And, it, and the only thing worse of like coyote like 
messing with you is like if you don't even know he's there doing it yep. and that makes it really tough people are like oh lucifer or whatever that's not real i'm like sure i totally get it i did, i used to not think it was real too but once i started seeing the world through that lens i was like oh no this is totally real <laughs> and it's again i'm not scared it has no power it literally has no power only the power we give to it but as long as you know coyote's trying to trick you he can't trick you as easily for sure um, this, so this resonates so much with muslims it's yeah the occupation, the Israeli occupation is coyote. It oh, makes people think totally. it, it makes people think that it's so strong and it could never be challenged or it makes people think that it's not even there in a negative way. Right. Mm -hmm. But it turns out that it's playing everybody against each other and trying to wreak havoc on the entirety of the world. I hope that makes it into the podcast. Yeah, he's going to come. <laughs> I edit this bad boy. <laughs> <laughs>